in the US, Canada, Australia, or Singapore, a few people heard of aphasia. But in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China, people do not ever heard of it. 失语症,咩嚟噶,唔识。失语症,我不懂。Aphasia is not recognized or named. I talk with Ren, Boston University researcher, Ginny, SLP, and Jen, students of SLP, discuss bilingual speakers with aphasia and explore the need for diverse SLP for necessary. Please subscribe and see you later! I'm Jen. I'm currently living in Maryland. Um, I am a virtual coordinator at the National Aphasia Association and a soon-to-be speech-language pathologist. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. And now, uh, where did you born? Um, I was born in Canada. Um, hi, I'm Jen. I am um, I'm originally from China, Nanjing, and right now I'm living in Boston. I'm a PhD student working in the aphasia research lab at Boston University with Dr. Swati Kiran. Hi, I'm Ginny Lam. Um, I'm a speech language pathologist currently based in New York. I'm originally from Hong Kong, just like Kitty. And um, yeah, I am a speech language pathologist that works both with adults population as well as younger children with speech language um, and communication disorders. Tell me more about your work with aphasia. I started becoming interested in aphasia population because we had an aphasia mentorship night in our graduate program. We invited people with aphasia to tell us and teach us graduate students about aphasia. Mm -hmm. And that's when I noticed that they have phenomenal stories, just beautiful personal stories that they, yeah. you know, that they're able to tell. And I just want to be a part of that team to mm -hmm. help these people to get their story out. Um, so I, ever since then, I've been very heavily involved in aphasia population. And so I really like working in both inpatient and outpatient, but especially in outpatient because I get to build more relationship and doing education with the patients. And so I worked in neural rehab for two and a half, three years in outpatient setting before I moved to New York. So that's uh, my experience with aphasia. And now I'm working with more bilingual populations, more uh, Chinese speakers. So I think that's been a, a blessing for me. So I actually have a funny story. I used to work in visual arts and entertainment. I was doing that for 15 years in New York City. And then my grandmother had a stroke. Um, and at the time she was living in Taiwan. So I moved back to Taiwan to be with her and be a care partner. At the time, I knew no Chinese. So that was very <laughs> stressful because um, I had to learn colloquial Chinese, but then also medical terms at the same time. So I didn't know about aphasia. Even I cared for her for six years and I didn't know about aphasia until I moved back to the U.S. to mm -hmm. study to become a speech language pathologist, which is pretty startling considering I was with her for six years. Yeah. Um, and so when I first learned about aphasia, I have always wanted to like give back to my community. And so I started volunteering at the Stroke Comeback Center, which is in Maryland and DC and Virginia. Um, and I just loved it so much. And uh, from there, I started working at the National Aphasia Association. And that's really where I want to be working. <laughs> so I actually first um, knew about aphasia um, was doing my master's study at, also at Maryland. I went to University of Maryland for my master's. Um, so I volunteered in the aphasia lab there. Um, and again, I worked with um, a couple of patients who had aphasia and they all had really touching stories. So that made me want to, you know, help them more. Um, and I guess during the process, I, you know, I was thinking there are so many more questions to be um to be answered um, in this in this field because it's all evidence based, and that makes me, you know, decided to go um, for uh, to do a PhD and then study more questions about aphasia. Um, 
um, I would say the clinical service or like the people are less realized um, or less aware of, of aphasia mm-hmm. um, or most clinical um, like uh, populations having like language or speech communications. I think in general, the awareness is relatively lower. Yeah. Um, they, they are definitely working hard to, you know, to um, uh, educate people to have more clinicians. But again, the, the source is relatively low. So the access to getting those services is uh, quite limited. I remember the, my childhood, uh, older women and older men just uh, uh, like, it's not talking. And uh, in the childhood, I said, oh, uh, uh, it is uh, like, a, <laughs> huh? Have you ever heard of old people? Old people? Thought that it was because of Alzheimer's or dementia. Yes, but but maybe is they are not low low Maybe they are aphasia, you know? So same with China and um, Taiwan. When I was in Hong Kong, I knew nothing about aphasia. Mm-hmm. Um, very limited understanding and public awareness of that. And that is why it is part of you know my personal goal to be able to do more public education and promotion on this field. Because I really want people yeah. to become more aware and also know that you can you deserve getting better better quality of life mm-hmm. and you can receive services so that you can communicate better. Because not being able to communicate has such a hindrance on the person's overall quality of life. And, um, and, and I think it tends to happen, especially with older populations, mm-hmm. that they felt like I have fewer years left you know, on earth and I want to leave the resources, especially you know, in the Asian community, tend to want to leave the resources to the younger population, which doesn't have to be the case, I think. Um, I, I think when, I, when my grandmother had a stroke, I did not know that she was experiencing aphasia. I did not know that I could help her with pictures, even you mm-hmm. know, with, with, uh, with AAC devices or pictures that can help her communicate or express herself better. And um, I, I wish I had known about that sooner. Um, so I really hope to be able to, um, to you know, work on this area of efficacy. Um, to the you know the Chinese population and you know and also expand the understanding of multi, um, bilingualism. Did you know uh, Taiwan is aphasia or not? So when I was in Taiwan, I and this might just be a language barrier because I was learning Chinese at the time, but I didn't know anything about aphasia until I moved back to the U.S. and studied um, speech language pathology. So. For me, I I remember like going to the hospital and seeing on the like on the hospital guide there was a line for speech language pathologist. But even though I had my grandmother, we just never went to that floor, so it wasn't something that we ever even thought about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I came to America and I was learning about Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, I was like, oh my gosh, I think my grandmother <laughs> has <laughs> this. And it was just even just that word, knowing the word aphasia, opened up so many doors for us. Because then I was able to like take more control over uh, my grandmother's care and really do some more research on my own for her. Um, I also agree. It's just so important that we have so many more but multilingual SLPs. I think if we look at the demographics of our profession, it's like very, <laughs> very much um, yeah. a, a white profession. I think it's something like 95% of SLPs are white and I don't know how many of those are multilingual or bilingual but it's just we definitely need more but I think even more important than that is something that Ginny brought up which is we need more like culturally cultural and linguistically responsible responsive speech language pathologists so even if you're not bilingual or not multilingual just sort of knowing like what you can do as an SLP to help people who are from different cultural and linguistic backgrounds as you. I think that's super important. I think there's just already so much going on in a person's life when they have a stroke and to have your language affected, it's like such a huge part of your identity. So that could be very challenging to face. On top of that, there's an extra layer of 
apprehension in therapy and planning, because then we have this new question of what language do we work in in therapy, especially in families where families like my family, where some people speak one language and then other people speak another language. And there's not like a, um, a crossover between the languages. And so I think there's just this whole new set of challenges that we, we face when, when we have like bilingual speakers. Is it possible um, to restore all languages, which is the native or second language? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I personally believe that it's always possible to make progress in all languages. Um, I think, you know, as long as the, I think it, the, in terms of the prognosis, when it comes to recovery, it really depends on a number of different factors. There are factors that we cannot change, such as the age or your concurrent medical conditions. There are other factors that it may be more personal. It could be motivation. It could be your support system. It could be just, you know, how you feel about yourself, your personal factors. Um, there are other things such as your exposure environment that you're using the language, um, mm -hmm. how much you're reading, how much you're writing, how much you're actually using it. Um, I think, you know, it's definitely possible to make progress, but it, it will be at a different rate and at a different pace for different languages. And as long as, um, you know, you have the right resources and the right, you know, people that can work with you on improving these languages. I think it's it's you know it's never a constant upward scale. It's often an up down up down up down like the stock market. And at the end yeah. of the day, you will always always make a positive um, you know upward movement. I think I tend to think of the human brain as just like the snowflakes because it's so unique and everyone has different experience. We all have different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to bilingual speakers, it really varies in terms of, I think there isn't as much research. I think we're still, um, Ram may be able to add on to that. I think we're still trying to collect more um, data to understand better in terms of how that impacts multilingual and bilingual populations. A lot of the current research that we have are, um, you know, with regard to bilingual speakers who speak European languages. And so when it comes to Asian languages, that may be a different, different, you know, different scenario because of the differences in, in the languages itself. And I think it depends on whether they, you know, they grow up speaking both languages simultaneously or they learn a new language sequentially and which language is their more dominant language. And also depends on the environment that they're currently in, you know, the community environments, like the living community and their speech community. Are they speaking mm -hmm. more in one language versus yeah. the other? And um, depending on, you know, uh, you know, what could happen, you know, the, the brain of that person, some language may be more affected versus the other and the recovery may be different as well. Yeah, for example, I'm born in Cantonese and then my primary school, I learned English and then most like uh, 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 every week I spoke Mandarin and uh, my mom and dad born in uh, Shanghai Nese, mm -hmm. uh, I spoke four languages but I have aphasia in uh, USA. And my friend and my coworker and I spoke English. And uh, in like uh, now three years, I learned to speak English, but not Cantonese because my each week, I, I, uh, my older sister and I talk uh, in uh, one hour, which is so different, you know. Um, this is, you know, the biggest challenge in the bilingual aphasia fields. And then the other thing that I think the researchers mostly are trying to um, get a better sense is that whether we train one language can help generalize or improve the other untrained language, because um, in reality, that will be very efficient for both the patient and also the clinicians. Um, so that's another question, you know, out there that people are, you know, um, trying to trying to get a better sense of. Um, and then like, like uh, Jeannie just mentioned, a combination of different factors, like how much 
um, experience of that language that you were exposed to before and after your brain injury, um, and also your, you know, pre-morbid or before um, how proficient you were in each language, um, your family history, your education background, like all those factors, they all play a role um, in your in your recovery. So that that plays, you know, um, that may affect uh, different people like in different ways. Final question. What is your superpower? Mm-mm-mm-mm. I think the superpower might be perseveration. Mm. Uh, being preserved on things that are, you know, challenging, difficult to achieve. I think stay, you know, the like stay powerful, stay strong to those things. I think we'll, we'll finally make progress. Yeah. Mm. What about you, Chen? So for me, I believe in people fully through any challenge. I believe and will root for people to be kind and fair, to be responsible and strong. Um, So yes, I just have an unwavering amount of belief in people. (laughs) (laughs) How about you, Jeannie? For me, I think it's being a good listener. Um, I think that in my clinical work and also in my personal relationship has really helped me to be able to listen between lines and understand some of the things that may not be directly spoken. It could be unspoken needs. And I think that helps me to really, you know, hone on to uh, these areas and really meet the needs that people have. And I think it's uh, it definitely takes practice and, um, and a lot of patience. So I think being able to do that and being able to build that trust with the people that I'm working with um, has been something that I'm really, really grateful for. Mm-hmm.